Welcome back to the Decarbonisation Summit in partnership with SSE Energy Solutions. Over the last day and a half, we've heard how important science and technology are to the decarbonisation and climate change challenge. And we will be focusing on science, technology and innovation in this afternoon's panel. Um, and I'm delighted to announce um, an incredible panel um, with the support of our partner, Tech Nation. Um, Tech Nation is the growth platform for tech companies and leaders through the Net Zero program. Tech Nation is accelerating the growth of the UK's most exceptional emerging cli climate tech companies to support each other and to decarbonize. Now to introduce our stellar lineup of speakers, and I'm delighted to say we have a, an impressive lineup of change makers, including from Tech Nation itself, Gerard Gretsch, the founding chief exec of Tech Nation, Hugh Thomas, the development director at Magway, a zero emissions delivery solution that tackles the problem of pollution head on. And joining us online, Professor Claire Gray, an award-winning Cambridge University chemist, chief scientist and co-founder of Niobolt, after discovering a way to dramatically enhance the performance and lifetime of batteries. And lastly, also joining us online, Wing Chan, a computer scientist and co-founder of Sourceful, an end-to-end -end platform for sustainable sourcing due to be launched next year. Thank you all to all of our panelists. Um, and for our online audience joining us, please do uh, send in your questions via the chat box on the live stream, and I'll pose these questions to our audience. Uh, first of all, I'd like to just go around the panel uh, and invite them all to give a sense of what they're doing to decarbonize. Uh, Gerard, I know you advise and work with other organizations on their decarbonization plans, so uh, could you answer that question or give us that sense of what you do on that basis? Sure, and uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you very much for the invitation. Uh, two things. One is obviously our company itself. So this is the first time that we actually uh, measured our own emissions. And uh, there's obviously quite a lot of stuff out there about how to go about it. And uh, we, uh, the reports showed that actually you know, 98% of our emissions are coming from scope three, which is to do with our supply chain. So as a result of that, we are really focusing on things like the, the suppliers we use for the things we use. Uh, we're secondly looking at our buildings and our offices and where we actually sort of have people. Uh, and thirdly, looking at the travel. Um, fourthly, looking at how to actually engage our employees and our, you know, my colleagues to sort of be part of that change that we want to see as, a, as, as part of the company. So we're really excited about that. But what I found when we were working with the team was that actually there's so much complexity, there's so much jargon out there that uh, ourselves alongside 15 other tech companies came together earlier this year in January and thought, why don't we actually form a task force and come up with a pledge as well as a toolkit to help companies to really demystify and de-jargonize this whole sphere. So, uh, we l subsequently launched uh, the Tech Zero Pledge and, and Task Force, and we've now had over 200 companies sign up to ensuring that they actually commit to publishing their numbers, like we have done a few months back, uh, on a yearly basis and commit to net zero by 2030. So I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about that during our, our, uh, our panel today. But uh, yes, so a number of things have happened very, very quickly over the last year. Very good. So I look forward to you not talking about V2G in a circular economy later. Uh, not quite, no. Thanks. Good. Uh, Hugh, tell us about Magway and uh, the work that you're doing to decarbonise, please. No, thank you. Uh, great to be here. Um, very much uh, you know, resonates your points with um, what we're doing, the, the jargon especially. Uh, actually, how do you effectively measure things? Uh, but we are at that development stage, so we're developing hardware and we're also developing the software. Uh, I suppose there's two things. One's come out of COVID, uh, a realisation that we can work remotely and uh, our team, uh, when they need quiet contemplation, development time, particularly on the software side, uh, they're able to do that without travelling. 
uh, but also on the hardware side when we're testing things, making uh, that possible from a remote location. So we've very um, early on in our development phase built in systems so that we can test on the track. And I'll come on to describe what Magway does later, but um, you know, the ability for people to do things remotely. And then very conscious about the embodied energy in the, uh, the system that we're building. And just as an example, we, we use pipes and uh, the, the reference pipe is a high density polyethylene pipe used by um, gas companies, um, used for sewerage, uh, water, etc. And uh, it's obviously made from, uh, from oil product. And we've been working with the National Composite Centre in Bristol saying, how can we do it from a different material? How can we use a plant-based material? And how can we be certain that um, you know, we are as close as possible delivering um, a carbon neutral uh, solution there. And what's fantastic about that, because we asked the question and it seemed nobody else was asking that question, we, we've got a lot of interest around that. Uh, so not only are we finding a solution for ourselves, but maybe you know, we're, we're enabling other people to see a solution for other things. Very good. Um, and uh, Claire, thanks for joining us online. Um, it sounds like you're doing some super exciting work over um, on the lifetime of batteries. Tell, tell us about your work and how that's contributing to decarbonisation, please. Yes, yeah, so I'm doing two things. One, as you mentioned, I'm the chief scientist at Nyabolt, and that's a new company or relative new, new company trying to develop very, very rapidly charging batteries. And it's based around particularly an anode that replaces graphite. So one of the problems with fast charging is heating and also lithium plating, which and then heating causes a series of degradation processes. So our material allows lithiums to go in very, very rapidly. And so that's just allowed us to rethink how fast you can charge a battery. And so that's an exciting in itself because there are many reasons why you want fast charging. But from a sustainability perspective, it allows you to rethink how big the batteries would be. And so if you look at the standard automobile, um, direction at the moment is to get more higher and higher range and we're pretty much at the limit of the the energy density how many electrons we can get out of conventional technology and so if you want to go for 300 400 500 miles you can do that by having a bigger battery but alternatively you could charge faster you could have a smaller battery but you'd have the confidence that in the 10 minutes you had to stop every hunt you would be able to charge your battery more rapidly so that's the sort of sustainability perspective and then at the same time i'm as, as an academic i'm very interested in um just jet battery generally technology more generally and i lead the uk's faraday institution project on battery degradation and degradation is important because of longevity of batteries. So the lo longer they last for, the more sustainable they are. We're also interested in developing new metrologies for inboard monitoring of batteries. And again, that's about how do you um, think about second life to batteries? How do you ensure that they don't degrade? And then the final point I wanted to make was, well, and I also work on next generation technologies, and we can discuss that later on in the panel. But the final point I wanted to make was that you know, the, the whole electrification of the automobile sector is going to be a massive change in education across the sector, from the people doing the repairs all the way through to the development. So I think the education part is also very important, and I'm also committed to that and work, work in that space as well. So brief introduction. Very good. Um, I think we are having some problems getting hold of Wing Chan. Um, so hopefully we can fix that and come back to her shortly. Um, diving into the main part of the debate. Um, we've spoken about finance and investment elsewhere in the decarbonisation summit. I think it's well understood there, there's a lot of money coming into the green tech sector now, some very, very large flows of capital, uh, but perhaps that money is not going to some of the startups that uh, are really deserving of some of that cash. Jared, what's your take on that question? Uh, I, I wouldn't necessarily agree with that. I, I think that, look, this is, you know, the UK was one of the first major economies to enshrine into law to commit to net zero by 2050. I think there's only one country so far that's reached net zero, and that's uh, Bhutan. And I think Sweden is at 2045. But all most of the other major countries are 2050. And I think in, within 30 years, I think you're seeing you're going to see a massive acceleration of innovation. And 
you know, this is really not just about innovation, but about scaling that innovation and then mass adoption. That's how we see it from our side. And we typically, as an organization, really deal with companies that are from 10 employees to about 1,000 employees maximum. And um, we really focus in on that sort of very, very uh, precious stage of a company's growth, which is the early stage, because 75% of startups fail within three to five years. So we are trying to do everything we can to ensure that that capital that goes in, as you were saying, into the talent is not at risk and, and make sure that they're as successful as possible. So I think we've seen a huge change in the financial landscape and specifically around venture capital. And uh, this year alone, you know, we've seen over $1.5 billion go into net zero companies in the UK. And there are, you know, just to give you perspective, there's, only, there's roughly about 500 net zero startups in the UK. And that accounts for about 18% of all net zero startups and scale ups in the whole of Europe. So the UK is you know, punching above its weight, and we're also seeing a lot of finance come in, especially in the last two years, as this narrative takes hold on people's consciousness. And uh, uh, you know, the types of companies that we're seeing are not just small startups, but we're seeing big growth companies with significant investment, like Arrival, which is an electric vehicle business, be valued at over $10 billion, which we tend to call a dedicorn. So, I think the shift has started, it's going to accelerate, and I think we're entering a decade of huge entrepreneurship. So I'm sort of, I'm very bullish on this. This, you know, and, and obviously, typically, after every crisis, and we've just come out, we're just coming out of one, hopefully, fingers crossed, you always see an entrepreneurial boom. You always see a huge boom in innovation. And so I, I, I really looking ahead, I'm seeing not only the money coming in, but the talent really stepping up and rising to the challenge that we have. Uh, I know you've been at COP26 for a few days now. Do you feel that this, that this COP is going to be a catalyst for even further investment in the science, technology and innovation sector? I think bringing back to the point I was making, this is really about scale. I think when you have multiple jurisdictions, multiple countries coming together and actually agreeing certain things, certain guidelines, you have consensus mechanisms that can really truly unlock scale. I think that's a positive thing. Now. Yes, the narrative is that, look, there's a lot of talk, but I think it's really helpful. I think this is the stuff that you can't really touch. It's intangible, but it's super valuable and it's needed. Then what tends to happen is that you'll get the disruptors. You know, the companies like Magway and, mm. and, uh, and, and other companies like you know, Naked Energy, that's all well and good, but they will literally, once they have the money, they will really truly scale their solutions mm -hmm and nothing will get in their way, uh, really. So I'm seeing political leadership. I'm seeing venture capital reach record highs. At the, UK, uh, the UK has seen $18 billion of investment go in UK technology this year, more than Germany and France put together. So I'm seeing that as well. And, and thirdly, uh, the infrastructure, the support ecosystems, the the growth programs that we're putting together and other accelerators are really helping scale this talent and scale this innovation because you know, we all know that 40% of the technology required to help decarbonize the atmosphere has yet to actually exist and scale. So that's why you know, we feel we're playing our part alongside these companies that are truly pioneers. Very good. Well, they say a, a crisis accelerates the future, and there can be no bigger crisis than the climate crisis. Uh, Hugh, in your work, do you see investment in the science, technology, and innovation sector flowing into your, into your work at Wag Magway? Yeah, it, it, it's, definitely, it's definitely there. Um, uh, I completely agree that uh, you know, technologies are just founding now, and uh, they're, they're moving through the startup stage and they're, they're beginning to get into the scale up stage and that's when the money really needs to flow in uh, at, at scale. We were, um, we were fortunate we founded just over four years ago we had initial high net worth in investment to get us started we were able to win an Innovate UK grant so it, it is important that there is that investment by government so there's that enablement uh, that you can bring um, 
tech companies' ideas together with academia, uh, that you, you tap into all uh, channels of innovation. Uh, and then we were approached by uh, one of the online funding platforms, Crowdcube. And I have to say we were a bit dubious to begin with because, you know, we're not a brewery. Um, you know, and kind of that's what people thought um, um, crowdfunding was about. Um, but they were very, very clear that they thought that their investors were interested in difficult things, long-term patient capital investments, uh, that they were interested in infrastructure that was going to make a difference. And they thought that Magway would appeal. And um, they were right. And we were uh, oversubscribed on the first round. But what was extraordinary, we got investors from over 60 countries. Our largest demographic was in the 18 to 34 year old. They didn't invest as much individually as people who were older, uh, but they invested in large numbers. And there was clearly a passion there for that. And, and I think that's a very um, interesting opportunity mm. for people. And that's, that's developing quite rapidly. There is a downside if you put your out there, yourselves out there and you, you get that investment, uh, you will have those young people beating on your door mm. saying, can I come and work with you? I, I, you know, I've bought into the passion and um, you know, I want to be part of it. So yep. <laughs> there is that slight downside. Interesting. Um, uh, so, we've got our first VC investor now and you know, heading to Series A next year. Yep. We, we're seeing that, uh, that journey really scaling. I mean, it's great to hear. When, when you think of investors, you tend to think of an older demographic, right? But perhaps you've got young people investing in their own future by investing in, in Magway, so. Yeah, and I think that's a real opportunity. And maybe we're also inspiring young people to think that, that they can do it. And, you know, um, we won't have all the answers. Yeah. A lot of the answers are gonna come from uh, yeah. young people. Yeah, Claire, can I come to you with that investment question? Do you, do you see the flows of capital coming into the green tech sector? Is, it, is the money coming your way? I think we're very lucky and we're about to go into series B and so and been so very successful so far and hopefully that will continue as we're trying to close around um, in the next few months. So, but I do think we should be honest though about how we fund in this country bigger activities. And so and you have in particular when you're talking about manufacturing. And so in the, the battery space, that's about building a battery line. And those cost to 200 million plus. And those are sectors where it's actually very difficult to obtain the funding. So I'm not actually talking about our company. So we're going to we'll address those sort of um, issues on manufacturing in the next stage by a joint venture or fundraising. But then that's a it's a very big it's a very different game. And I'd be interested in hearing from others in the panel. Mm. But that's the space where it's difficult to to, to, to get investors because of the risk aspects and so there is a challenge that we need to be upfront about if we want in the UK to build the gigafactories we have to think about how they get funded. Thank you and uh, Wing, Wing Chan thank you very much indeed for joining us um, so uh, you're the co-founder of Sourceful an end-to-end -end platform for sustainable sourcing and you're launching next year presumably if you're launching next year investment has been uh, part of your uh, part of your project recently, where, where, do, where do you see things in terms of the investment piece with, that, with those flows of funding coming into the clean tech sector? Yeah, thank you, Aid. Great to be here. I mean, if we think about the previous two decades were about digitizing. Um, my father was a computer scientist. I studied computer science. I think the next two are about decarbonizing. And so actually, when we started Sourceful, we wanted to work on something quite boring, actually and no one would pay attention to, some people might call it unsexy supply chains. Who's gonna talk about that? Uh, but actually we realized that decarbonizing only works if these new breakthroughs get used. And more and more, as, uh, as Gerard said, VC and investment is coming in to make that um, joint between the materials and technologies and actually consumer applications. And so we were really lucky to have Index Ventures who normally invest at Series A and larger stage come in early and lead our seed round earlier in this year. And I'm um, really excited by the progress that um, Tech Nation has made. We actually joined the Net Zero 2.0 cohort. So we applied on day one for the Net Zero 1.0 cohort. Maybe we were a bit too early at that stage, but now we're part of the, the cohort there and benefiting from um, that community of startups to learn from. We heard from Greenbackers yesterday. I think if, if you know, if you're if you're young, you've got a great idea, great technology and good people working for you, then uh, it's a really exciting time to see your business grow. Um, so aside from maybe your own 
businesses, Claire and, and Wing. Um, to move on to another question, what, what, technology do you think, do you, what technologies do you think we should focus on um, as we try to, to decarbonize at pace? Uh, Wing, maybe if you'd like to take that question first. Sure, so we talk about the breakthrough agenda that got uh, released earlier this week, and it's about electricity, vehicles, green steel, hydrogen, sustainable farming. I guess for us at Source4 and more broadly, it's all about access to better materials. Um, ultimately, we have such a big reliance on fossil fuels, not just for energy, but also in, in terms of what people make things with. And the biggest technology improvements, I think, come into being able to move away from a plastics driven economy, as well as moving away from uh, an environment where there's so much wastage in the supply chain. So we see that amount, the amount of materials that get used versus actually end up being used for a long time by consumers, there's so much wastage along that journey. And so we're really excited by the technologies that come in that make materials uh, last longer, um, work harder, and start to replace the, the ones that we've been using and relying upon for the last 30, 40 years. Thank you, uh, Gerard, a technician. You look at a whole spectrum of organizations, tech companies in the, in the sector. If you could look at that with a, an abstracted view, which are, the, which are the areas we should most focus our fire on, particularly to look at the subject of decarbonization, do you think? So yeah, I think decarbonizing the atmosphere is super important. And there are lots of companies that are doing it in different ways. Obviously, there's carbon removal technologies. There are companies which are providing services which will reduce the need for, for plastic and manufacturing types. But I, in addition to that, I think I'm also seeing types of companies that are actually providing intelligence of our future through AI and machine learning and sort of mathematical modeling using, you know, as more and more data becomes available. So that's not necessarily decarbonizing. It's, it's also how do, we, how do we protect our assets, our infrastructure, which is at risk of climate change. And that could be, you know, hurricanes, uh, floods, uh, millions of people. Uh, if we see that and are able to verify that using satellite technology a lot sooner, 10 years earlier, then governments and jurisdictions can move a lot quicker in protecting people from being uh, at risk. So I don't quite know what the name for that is, would, but but I'm just thinking of a sort of a, I'm, think, I'm thinking of a company called Cervest, which is a climate intelligence business. Mm -hmm. um, and so you know it's started by PhD students, and I think we're seeing a lot of as I think innovation is really coming from anywhere. You know, whilst we think that the valley is the place where a lot of this innovation is coming from, I would say that I think the valley peaked in around 2014 in its share of tech unicorns. Uh, and actually, Europe has the most cities with one or more tech unicorns than anywhere else in the world. So I think we have lots of capital cities. We have a lot of second tier cities that are very good at attracting ambitious, clearly intelligent driven people. And, and that, in effect, is having such a positive impact in, in a lot of companies that we're seeing which are dealing with decarbonization within cities and buildings, which is a huge part. Agriculture, I think over 60% of our companies in, in the first cohort were outside London. Um, so agriculture is a huge part that we're seeing. Um, and, oh, but we're also seeing companies that are really trying to make it as easy as possible for companies to measure their own emissions. <laughs> and as I was saying earlier, the reason why we started net zero, or tech zero, I should say, is because you know, there was so much jargon out there. And, and I, 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 was, I wasn't even aware of scope one, two, and three emissions till about six months ago. I can't expect anybody to be, really, necessarily. And so there's lots and lots of innovation. I think there's more innovation now in this space than ever before. And actually looking ahead for next year, we're actually thinking about what to do because you know, we, you know, our, our current cohort is 30 companies. We did 30 companies last year. But as I said, there are around, there's at least 500 or more net zero type companies. But a lot of them are in the energy space and decarbonizing space, to your question. <clears throat> You're making me feel good about the, the panel selection we had for the decarbonization summit. You've touched on a lot of sectors that we've covered off over the last day and a half. Um, Claire, coming back to you uh, uh, at Cambridge, I, I know that uh, Cambridge is a real hub for 
innovation and, and science and technology. Um, what do you see in your wider work um, in your in your experience at Cambridge University that uh, that shows the areas that are really of a, of, a, of a key focus for decarbonisation? Well, I mean, whether or not it's at Cambridge or not, I think one of the areas that we really need to focus on is the recycling and the change in manufacturing, so that that, for example, our batteries and the things we make can be recycled, and putting everything into a uh, putting a life cycle analysis so the companies that are get funded should be funded with life cycle analysis embedded in the costing and so I, I think that's moving forward what really has to be focused on is, is more companies thinking about recycling second life and sustainability because particularly in the battery space you know, energy storage is about storing stuff and so you have to think about the mineral resources associated with that so that that's where I'd like to see more focus um, in terms of what, in terms of Cambridge, sorry, I'm sitting on a in a bad spot. In terms of Cambridge, you know, there's a lot of exciting things going on, and we could we could talk about that. But I think in terms of what we need, sustainability should be really at the front of it. Thank you very much, Hugh. Um, you work in the transport sector. Presumably, that's a big area of focus for you, and one that you think is a key vector for decarbonisation. Is that right? Well, I think it's interesting that you've been talking about sectors. Uh, as though um, we, we need to solve problems which are defined as a sector. Um, the way I'd respond is that what Magway does is it goes across many sectors. And what we need is to, to think how do we break down those silos of sectors because the answers aren't just going to be in you know, the battery space or the agricultural space. It's about combining those things and seeing where's the synergy uh, and where's the shared learning and where's the opportunity uh, to innovate based on what others are learning. And we've got to do that very, very rapidly. And what Magway, we've discovered, is doing, it's creating an ecosystem. So you characterise it as, as transport, um, moving physical things, but we're also at the heart of the digital revolution. So you know, the idea of very deep inventory, understanding where things are coming from, uh, what we know about them, what is their, um, their embodied carbon, what is the carbon associated with moving them, um, where they're going to and when they need to get there and how they will be integrated with something else, how they'll be used and how eventually they, they'll be returned or recycled. Um, we sit at right at the heart of that and we're a, a communication channel uh, as much as a physical uh, movement of objects. Um, so we're, we're enabling a whole load of innovation at the edges of the system. You know, what do we do with the circular economy? Uh, you might say you know, we're transport. You might characterise us as a, a, a transport business, but as we're moving things and we're taking things to people, we're also able to, able to take things back. So we're enabling somebody to think about, well, as I do that journey, could I do something else? Could I offer something to the customer? And there's extraordinary innovation that comes out of being able to ask those questions across multiple sectors. So you know, my answer would be, please, let's not think in terms of sectors and silos. We, we need to think across whole systems. Very good. In the spirit of the de jargonization of decarbonization, could you just uh, explain for our wider audience what, uh, what that circular economy piece means, please? Well, um, w when you have something delivered to you, um, you know, Knowing what is the, the value of that object, um, is it something that uh, has packaging that could be recycled, does it have some, some components um, that might uh, need repairing, that uh, enables uh, that object to be repaired more efficiently, enables it to be recycled more efficiently, um, enables it to be shared. So do you actually have to own an object or is it something that you, you could share as part of the community? If you can move that object between people, then that becomes a lot easier. If, if the object requires some special input, then is, is there a node that you can create uh, that uh, those objects are clustered around so that um, they can be uh, effectively traded? Or if you're a specialist manufacturer or you have um, specialist knowledge uh, and you're part of an ecosystem where you can move things when they need to move to somebody else in that value chain, that that is immediate and you're only moving that one thing when you need to move it. So that maybe uh, goes to the heart of um, some of the uh, additive manufacturing uh, revolution that we're seeing. So you know, all of these things start to unlock if you think more broadly that you're not just a, a transport um, yeah. 
or perhaps in super simple terms, there's, there's just no such thing as waste. There's just a, an end of life resource that then needs to get reused in some future life good or service. Well, if we can start thinking about that, what is the, the value attached to things? Yep. Um, so I guess no energy can be created, right? So it's just passed on. Yeah, exactly that. <laughs> Um, so, uh, coming to our online audience, there's a question that's come in now, um, which says, um, can we afford to wait for market forces to make the new green technology transition? How, how, might, we, how might we look to other ways to speed up innovation and progress in science and technology to deliver on decarbonisation? Hugh, would you like to take that question first? Uh, I think market forces are critical, and the, the consumer, really, I think, is at the heart of that. You know, people are starting to ask for different things. They're starting to ask questions which are actually quite difficult for um, businesses to answer today. I mean, you, you've got the whole jargon uh, question, but um, you know, people are really feeling it very, very personally. And I, I think as we start to see the realities of climate change, what we've already baked in uh, to global systems, you know, impacts of flooding, extreme heat, uh, etc., then uh, people will become far more conscious and they, they will be far more active in asking questions. So the, that's, and we're seeing it at COP, I think that does a very strong message that business is um, you know, actually coming to the table and uh, wanting to understand what they can do. So that's a, a degree of market force. I think um, enabling innovation and as tech nations doing, you know, enabling people to connect as much as anything else and share knowledge, share experience uh, and understand how do you develop that's very important. So if, if you can get that ecosystem of businesses started and you can get the consumer asking questions, you can get big business saying, well, we've got to solve this. Uh, we don't have the answers ourselves. How do we go and find them? How do, who do we engage with? Um, you're going to build that ecosystem and it has to scale. We have to do this incredibly rapidly. And if there's one message that's really resonated with me uh, through COP, it's uh, what John Kerry and Al Gore and others have been saying. You know, we, we faced the issue of denial, people saying it's not real. And you know, on the whole, we've won that battle. But the battle ahead of us is delay. I would do it, but if only, uh, you know, if that happened, I could do this. Delay is our, uh, our biggest enemy now, and we've got to get that ecosystem going so that we can you know, really force through that, um, that delay agenda and really drive to action. Thank you. Uh, Wing, can I throw this question over to you, uh, the, mar the market oh. um, forces question? Do you, where do you see things? Do you, I mean, we're here at COP26, which is as much about mm -hmm. bringing governments together to introduce regulatory frameworks to drive change forwards. What's your take on that question? Yeah, it's a great question. So let's start with Sourceful's thesis was that consumers are becoming more and more aware of the impact of their choices. So they're looking for better options and they're getting dissatisfied because what's available to them is something that they've always been using, which is not great, or a more expensive choice. And so we then went back a step and said, looked at the brands and the businesses, what are they doing? And now they are more aware of what consumers want and they're looking for better choices, but they can't find it. And so the reason why we think they can't find it is because we think supply chains are broken in two ways. One, they're not efficient. There's a lot of wastage, which is also economic. And the other one is that they're not resilient. So to Gerard's point around um, Sylvest and being able to use data to see risks, there's also lots of resiliency problems in supply chains. So when we think about accelerating market forces or bringing the cost of sustainability down, it's about how do we improve supply chains. And that way, it makes it more attractive for brands to go further. So first of all, with uh, costs in the supply chain, can we actually bring products to market that are cheaper and more sustainable? So one of our brands that we worked with earlier this year, Benton, it's a B Corp brand, they actually made their um, whole packaging more sustainable. Um, they also brought the cost down by over 50% and they completely rebranded their packaging. And that type of change is exactly what consumers are looking for. And so these stories, as well as the media output, and I think actually the media, whether it's Sky News having its uh, climate channel or Bloomberg Green or things like COP and these types of activities like this panel today are actually about driving the urgency of consumers, which would then pull businesses and the supply chain forward as a result. So I think that is the biggest enabler that we see. It only matters if customers actually end up being able to use it. Claire, what's your take on this? Yeah, I, I mean, I, I want to push back slightly. I mean, I, I agree with all you're saying, but I still think there is a place for regulation because we're seeing societies that are increasingly 
uh, marginalized or sectors of society that are increasingly marginalized and we need to make sure that we we bring them along and that may mean funding councils to put more charging points in putting the charging points in difficult places where businesses are not going to want to put them making sure that the that sectors of the community the community don't get missed out in the green revolution retraining workers who might lose their jobs as motor mechanics and so I think there is a place for government to do more than the rhetoric, but actually think about how to enable some of these things. And yes, I think there is a consciousness that's been raised by COP, but there are still sectors of um, the, 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 the UK and other parts of Europe and the US and other places, it isn't, it isn't the forefront of their agendas. So I think we have to think about ways that we bring everybody along. And yes, cool things will help, and. And, um, but there's more. There's also more that's needed, and I think regulation does play a role in that. And the regulation often plays a role in terms of circular economy and life cycle analysis as well. Thank you very much. Let's move now on to the question of the global distribution and equitable distribution of new technologies. We we perhaps think about um, too much in the in the global West, but uh, thinking about that that wider international take up of the technologies that are going to deliver decarbonisation solutions around the world. How, how do we address that? Wing, Wing you, uh, you're nodding to that one. What, what's your take on that question? Yes, I think one of the big questions, right, is around um, how does the developed uh, nations ask that the developing nations do more now when they didn't have to do that earlier. And I think one of the answers or one of the uh, remedies for that is to help the companies and countries to skip uh, generations of technology. So a good example is, is when China actually didn't have laptops, didn't have personal computers, so they actually went straight to mobile phones and apps. Meanwhile, the Western world spent two decades trying to figure out how to make a website load fast on a mobile device. China went straight to mobile devices. And if can we do that the same thing as we build power plants and infrastructure in the developing countries in the new cities, can we go straight to a world where we think about electricity rather than burning coal straight away? Can we think about how we make solar panels and how do we make education early on? And I still come back to this idea of it's about awareness, but also awareness that drives uh, people to go and do things. You can put um, you know, electric charging ports everywhere, but you also have to incentivize people to buy the cars. You have to do all of these things together. And so I, I agree that it's about um, having both the consumers and the government support this. But I think in terms of making developing nations come across faster. It's about how can we uh, teach them the lessons and bring the lessons earlier, rather than doing what we did 20 years ago and just giving that to them because it was, it's cheap and easy for us to do so. Gerard, in your, in your work at Tech Nation, do you address that global equity question around technology around the world? A, a lot of our companies obviously operating outside the UK, uh, into Europe, into India and Australia, the US. I, there's Jeff, then definitely a view that technologies that work in the UK or perhaps in Western Europe or e Europe as a whole doesn't necessarily translate into other markets for sure. And I think that would be a mistake in any way. In any case, I, I would say that they are probably looking ahead. I would probably see more innovation <laughs> coming from the places where you least expect it. I, I, I think there is now the internet has enabled, you know, through mobile phones, you know, the next billion coming online is in Southeast Asia, and they'll be using smartphones. And the amount of knowledge sharing that will happen as a result of an, internet, an interconnected world will mean that people will be coming out with all sorts of solutions uh, from anywhere. And, and so I don't think you will necessarily see, like we've seen the last two decades where we've seen uh, a physical cluster be extremely well known for innovation and digital innovation specifically. I think now I truly believe that innovation will come from anywhere. So um, the capital may not necessarily come from anywhere and I think that's the thing to focus in on um, because I do agree with some of the panelists about the fact that we do need regulation to nudge. Not only nudge people but also nudge industries as well as nudging financiers, because you really want that money to go into the most driven people and most driven talent around the world. And talent is evenly distributed. Opportunity, unfortunately, is not just yet, but it is getting a lot better. And so I think 
the net zero agenda is such a great example, uh, such a great example for me in driving that more equitable society that we all want to see. Claire, can I throw this one over to you? Uh, what's your take on the equitable take up of technologies around the world? Yeah, I, I'm, I, I mean, one of the, the tragedies in the UK is the cutting of the age budget. And the thing that ended up being cut was the science part. Um, so there is a push to change that. And I, I would make a call to our government to actually think about how to help and engender science because that helps local communities think about their own resources, adding value to their own. And, and I was very involved in a, a program to get young African scientists going, and, and that was canned just overnight. And that was one where we were encouraging people to develop energy programs in African universities. And just through that program, I saw the real challenges working with people with essentially very little internet. And it's all very well to have to think about being an entrepreneur, but if you can't actually get a decent internet to your the town that you're living in, it is it's, it's very challenging. So, I think we have a lot to do, and I think it's it's difficult for young startup companies like ours to be engaged in all countries. Um, but it, it is essential that we have to, and we have to think about um, helping entrepreneurs globally get going. And um, I just hope, as the UK, we can rethink our I don't want to use the word aid because that's not what it's about, but I like to hope to think about ways that we can bring bring everyone up together and um, help to help train young entrepreneurs in the African continent, which is the continent I've just done a little bit more work in. Um, I mean, you know, India is a great place with, in terms of entrepreneurship, and maybe maybe we can learn from how how that that progressed. So, I'm optimistic, but also very realistic about some of the challenges on the ground. Yeah, but perhaps it's in the global south where they're going to be um, at the forefront of the changes that uh, a, a warming world would deliver. So that's where the innovation needs to be focused, perhaps. Well, and yeah, and then it's where a lot of the resources are. And so how do you think about and add, adding value? So if you take, for example, um, lithium coming out of Chile or Bolivia or Argentina, there's a definite disincentive for the Chileans to add value of lithium locally because it competes with the Americans who are buying it, the Chinese who are buying it. And so there's sort of, there are, there are inherent inequalities because of the, the way that the supply chains work. And maybe Wing Chang has more insight to this than I do, but we do need to think about these and be upfront about it. So I'm not trying to be negative. I just think we need to be honest about some of the challenges that are faced. Hugh, what's your take on this equity piece? Uh, it's something that we've had to consider simply because of the, the scale of opportunity and um, w what we're offering has been picked up uh, globally and we've, we have people talking to us from around the world and how, how do you cope with that? Um, so how, how do you make, we're, we're a, a technology developer, we're not going to build the systems, others will do that, we enable others to do that. So how, how do we uh, allow communities to engage with that? So right at the heart of the business is the idea we're a digital business and everything we do is part of effectively of a digital twin. And that's, uh, you know, at the heart of the business, we are building a digital twin of ourselves as a business, but also the system uh, that we'll be deploying. And one of the benefits of that is we're building a toolkit that enables anywhere in, uh, anybody anywhere in the world to say, well, what would happen if I put a magway in? Um, how can I use large data? How can I use mapping technologies and draw a B-spline on um, GIS and look at, what am I connecting at? How far is it? And uh, what would it cost? What materials would I use? What is the, the impact of that? Was the embodied carbon? Uh, but what's the market I enable? So if people can play with that and begin to see how they could deploy the technology, it, uh, it enables them to think on how they're going to innovate around that. So th that's very important to us that we, um, just in, in order to cope with the scaling of the technology, we build those toolkits and we make them, them available. Where we are uh, talking to um, in different territories, what we're finding is certainly from central government perspective, a real interest that you know, here is a new technology 
uh, that will need an industrial uh, production capacity, manufacturing capacity behind it. It will need new thinking about how infrastructure is built and there is an opportunity for us in this territory if we build some of it to make the bits. And that spurns you know, development of new industrial sectors. It, uh, it certainly drives into education and training of people. Um, and that has a material impact. So you know, if we can get that message out and help people, we certainly can't do it all ourselves. And that's not our intention. Uh, how do we enable people to understand uh, the opportunity and then really get on with delivering it? Let me pose a more critical question now. I mean, there's a strong argument to say technology and innovation actually got us into this problem with uh, a, cl a warming world and, and climate change. Um, do we not need to look at behavior change and simplification uh, ideas, not just technology fixes? What's your, what's your take on that subject, Gerard? I think uh, if you look at human history, we, we seem to create markets out of problems we, we had before, right? So we, we create the problems and we create markets for those problems. Um, so I, I would say I kind of tend to agree with you to some extent. I think, though, Technolo technology is a huge driver of change and and discovery. I think you know the bicycle is a is a huge technological invention. I mean, getting from one place to another to see your mother or your grandparents quicker, I think, is a good thing. Yes, uh, you can walk, but I think the, so. So I think I don't think we should beat ourselves up too much about the fact that technology. There's always a bad side to every good thing there is. I I do think though that we're going to have to rely on a, a lot more technology than I think we first thought when it comes to decarbonizing the atmosphere, just because of speed. I don't think uh, us changing as people through regulation is going to be necessarily enough within 30 years. That's only one generation. So you need catalysts. And I do believe that technology is a huge catalyst in that change. So perhaps reframing the question, technology has got us into the problem we didn't understand the problem we were creating and now technology is the solution now we understand the the immense scale of the climate change problem well, well a catalyst is you know it's is 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 creating uh, a reaction at a lower temperature i mean that's what i mean it literally i think we need the technology I, d I don't and i'm not saying i'm not look i i do believe in the human race i'm just saying that it, looking at history change uh, you know, change comes either through adaptation or through crisis. So I think you made the point earlier, you know, we are in a crisis mode. Not necessarily everybody would sign up to that. So you need a catalyst, and I think technology can play it's a, a big role in really, in really changing our behaviors. I think if you look at the fact that of how we use our phone, there's lots of things that are very good for us. You know, it's more convenient, and, and lots of entrepreneurs have made our lives a lot more convenient, but there's been a price to that. But if, imagine directing that energy into us being uh, better citizens and being nudged in the right way all the time, I think, you can, I think we're entering a world of all sorts of possibilities. I understand I'm on difficult territory here talking to a panel of technologists about technology possibly being the problem. But uh, Claire, what's your sense of that question? Well, I'm going to agree um, that it has to be both. I mean, and the, and I think you've mentioned a catalyst being a lower temperature, but a catalyst is actually something that allows you to get there in an easier way, which is, is, is possibly another even better way of looking at the same thing. But I think we have to embrace new ways of living and, and there are going to be some positives to that. And in, in, the, in the car area, I think we're going to have to think of different car share i mean they're all the sort of very obvious things that people are thinking about so i i, I think we, we we do both i think it's sort of an easy easy one technology helps but at the moment we have to throw everything we can get at this problem so wing is is the is technology the answer with that framework of understanding of the climate change problem is that how you see it yeah i think crisis is uh, is a great driver of course i think what's changed though here is impact awareness so talent would initially go into consulting, banking, the big four, the big six, magic circle, and so on, because there wasn't this direct impact awareness of what you're doing have any impact, right? So all things being equal, why not go for industries with big salaries and more stability? And then as digitizing became a big industry, 
people went to the new big salary, big stability companies in tech. Um, but what's changing now is uh, people are seeing that they are having an impact. The choices that they make as individuals, the choices they make as families and as employees helping to drive a big company forward has an impact and they want to go somewhere else. And that's the trend that Gerald's been talking about in his, in his wider work. But it's not just entrepreneurs and it's not just technologists. It's also everyone else that goes into making a business successful. You need accountants, you need business developers, you need sales team, marketing, lawyers, and you need investors. And making this space more attractive and urgent is the key, I think, ultimately. You can't just focus on the technology. And part of why technology maybe went down a certain path is because it was left alone as a certain, like, let's just upside and not manage the downside. So you need researchers that look at human behavior and, and talk about things like what is the impact on developing countries and social media impact on mental health. So these auxiliary things are super important and making them feel important and impactful and purposeful is what's coming to the next generation. Like we're hiring more 20, 21, 22 year olds than ever before because they're choosing to come straight here rather than go to a, a standard route. And that's so exciting and not saying that we expect it to have when we started the business. Hugh, can I hand over to you on that? Slightly well, tricky question. Thanks for asking me last because it's been really interesting hearing the other answers and I, this isn't a fully formed thought but um, if you unpick the question and you think you know, did technology get us into this mess? Well, it wasn't technology alone it was massive social change. So if, if you look back to the 80 years that created the, uh, the industrial revolution, massive agrarian revolution that we forget about, whole scale movement of people into cities, extraordinary social change. You can argue that um, the industrial revolution enabled uh, colonialism. It, it enabled us to, to start creating um, global supply chains and uh, you know, the, the nation state almost. So it wasn't just technology, it was extraordinary social revolution. And um, I think you have to look at both. So technology, the 80 years that could have defined the industrial revolution, we've got to replicate that probably in the next 10 years. We've got to create the foundation stones similar to the industrial revolution in the next decade, if we've got any chance of hitting 2050 globally. Um, and what the, the lesson potentially of the technological revolution coming from the industrial revolution is that the social revolution has to happen as well. It's inevitable. So we, we've got to think more broadly. And again, I'll say, you know, we shouldn't be thinking in silos. We've got to be thinking holistically. So, uh, you know, I, I think I'm picking the question. It's about what is the social revolution, which is all about, um, you know, how, how do we have a, a just um, adjustment? You know, how, how do we respond globally and how do we really get those those mechanisms out on the um, you know the, the, the widest front uh, that's to me a, a critical part of it very good to, to finish uh, we've got a few just a few minutes left now to finish then on a slightly more positive note I asked you at the, um, to, to think about what uh, you might find inspirational from some of the other speakers Jared uh, what what have you heard in the conversation today today that's inspired you I think just sitting in the presence of, of, of three entrepreneurs uh, doing amazing things, right? I think th this is the kind of pioneering spirit we need to uh, foster and encourage as much as possible. So uh, I think it's always a that, but also combined with some of the comments that were made earlier by some of the panelists about the fact that it's not just entrepreneurship that will make the change happen. It's actually a combination of many things, and, and government has to play a huge role in, in this now more than ever because this is not a national crisis. This is a, a truly global crisis that will need a lot of jurisdictions to work together. So I, uh, I'm in full agreement of that. But very, very inspiring to be in the presence of such amazing work. <laughs> so, uh, Claire Wing, you're, you're now defined as uh, decarbonization pioneers. Uh, Claire, What's inspired you from this conversation today? Well, I think Wing Chang's uh, last comments on just the younger people joining his business from different sectors and that it takes more than just the entrepreneurs. It will take everybody and everybody thinking about this. And that's a really inspirational sort of thing to end on. So I'll, I'll leave it with, with, with his comments. 
I was very inspired to hear Hugh's story about the young people investing in their crowdfunding activity. Wing, what, what was the thing that uh, most interested you in this conversation? I think uh, Professor Claire's notes on working in uh, with African uh, young people, entrepreneurs, and, and the challenges they face, but also the fact that the solutions will come from anywhere, as, as Gerald said, and, and actually we need to um, help funnel, uh, whether it's funding or time or just uh, more awareness to help them solve the problems because they're the ones closest to it. And I always think that the, the best innovations come when you solve the problems that you can see and you can you can feel and personally get attached to. And so um, just knowing that people uh, from Cambridge are thinking about this is, uh, is, great, to, is great to know. You a final word from you, please. I, I think there's an emerging community. Uh, people like-minded, driven by um, understanding of the problems we face, coming at it from a different angle, but willing to, to share and you know, innovate with their innovation. And uh, it, it's the passion of young people, as you say, the people who've chosen to invest in us. It's mobilizing that on a global scale. And you know, you know, the comments that we've heard, they, they, uh, to me, they really resonate with that view that this is possible if we all get together and we share as we've been doing and take this, you know, this more broadly. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, thank you to all of our panelists, to Gerard, to Hugh, over in Cambridge Online, to uh, you, Claire, to Wing. Uh, thank you very much to Tech Nation for supporting this science, technology and innovation panel at the Decarbonisation Summit. Hugely inspiring to hear your ideas. This afternoon, we will finish uh, with a panel on policy. So we'll take a short break now, but please do return to the policy panel later on at the Decarbonisation Summit. Thank you very much indeed. <laughs>